Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Novak is certainly no stranger to Iowa. He's graced this campus with his presence in previous years to share his insights. And it was Karen Laub of Cresco, Iowa, that he married in 1963. So he's visited Iowa a number of times to visit Karen's parents. He's also been political campaigning. Karen incidentally brought a nice gift back to Iowa besides their three children. She won the commission for a bronze statue to honor Norman Borlaug, the Nobel Prize winner, and that statue is now on display in their mutual hometown of Norman and Karen, Cresco, Iowa. So her presentation tomorrow evening in the gallery room here at Memorial Union will include slides of that work and other works while they we're in progress, and the subject will be the artist's way of life, way of life 8 o'clock in the gallery room. She'll also be speaking tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in St. Thomas Lounge on the inner way about how people grow. And she'll also be speaking at noon at the YWCA on sisterhood, women's liberation, women working outside the home, children, and so on. You can also see slides of her work on Channel 5 WOI next week. Wednesday, May 7th at 12.30 on the Here and Now show. Uh, tonight's one-to-one uh, -one show on WI helped make Michael Novak even less a stranger to these parts of Iowa, but Michael is really not a stranger to a lot of parts of the world. His educational journey, formal educational journey, took him from Johnstown, Johnst Johnstown Pennsylvania to Holy Cross Seminary in Notre Dame. Stonehill College in Massachusetts, Gregorian University in Rome, and Catholic University in Washington, D.C. His studies and fellowships have included Harvard and Stanford, and he has taught among those places also Union Theological Seminary and the State University of New York. But in addition to, in addition to his teaching, he's also a perceptive reporter. For many of us, the book Open Church, which was the result of his reporting of the Second Vatican Council, explained to many Catholics the direction the church was taking, and he showed that for a long time power was held in the church by what he called non-historical orthodoxy, those who thought that orthodoxy and dogmas just sprung up from nowhere and should not change. Recently, he has accused or criticized liberals for historical orthodoxy, for paying too much attention to just what seems relevant today and not enough to the past or other ages. His reporting also carried him to Vietnam to investigate the war, and some of his reports helped raise serious questions in the minds of Catholics and other Americans about that war. As I mentioned, he's, already, he's also been on the American campaign trail for people like Edmund Muskie, George McGovern, and Sergeant Shriver. He's also no stranger to the world of intellectuals and publishing. His books and articles have appeared in every major Western language. He's associate editor of three major religious journals. And his readers, I might say, often find he's not a stranger in another sense. Publishers Weekly says he combines the long view of the philosopher with the intuitive insights of the poet. And most of all, a kind of warm human presence comes across with insight and intelligence. For many people, for especially students, belief and unbelief introduced them to Bernard Lonergan's idea of the unrestricted desire to know as the sense of God's presence with us. Then he explored theology further in its institutional context with a theology for radical politics, then culturally the experience of nothingness, and finally gathering it together in Ascent of the Mountain, Flight of the Dove on Religious Studies, which will be the subject of his talk this evening. I do want to mention just briefly two other books that were mentioned tonight on television, Choosing Our King and The Rise of the Unmeltable Ethnics, because Choosing Our King, which examines how symbols function in American politics, will be the subject of his talk tomorrow morning at Lush Auditorium at 10 o'clock, and then The Rise of the Unmeltable Ethnics, which he dealt with also on television tonight, uh, in which he also criticized the melting pot myth of America will be the subject of his talk tomorrow uh, afternoon at 4 o'clock at 124 Ross Hall. It also led 
partly through a grant and work at the Rockefeller Foundation, to his own founding of MPAC, EMPAC, to which some leaflets will be available in case you are especially interested in that subject. Uh, it's a civil rights organization for white ethnic Americans, and he's now executive director of that organization. He's also doing consulting work around the country in the areas of education, politics, government, and business. Following tonight's presentation, Mr. Novak will answer any questions that you may have concerning these subjects, especially the one he's dealing with this evening. And then you're all invited to an open reception at the YWCA, an open reception both for Michael and for his wife, Karen. Uh, the Novak's appearance here on campus is sponsored by St. Thomas Aquinas Parish, St. Cecilia's Parish, UMHE, United Ministries for Higher Education, Campus Ministry Association, and the Iowa State Committee on Lectures. With that introduction, I present to you Mr. Michael Novak to speak on religion, a quest for personal identity. Thank you very kindly for your warm welcome. I'm happy for the chance to be with you, and I, I look forward very much to the, uh, the question period afterwards, uh, which is the time at which I learn most, and uh, I discover what you're <clears throat> perceiving from what I say, and I can learn from your questions and your criticisms uh, better than in any other way. That's especially important if we're talking about religious studies, because if religious studies aren't the study of how people actually live and how they think and strive and so forth, uh, there really is something very hollow and very empty at the heart of the studies. More than most studies in the university, more than most studies in intellectual life, religious studies are about a very intimate, a very personal, and also a very social part of each one of us. Thus, what goes on in each one of you, in each one of us, is part of the field of study, simply part of the data for which students have to create adequate theories. And indeed, they have to test their theories, at least in part, against our experience, and if not against our experience, against the experience of still others. There's a marvelous circle in religious studies in which the theory must grow out of the life or the lives of people. The theory grows out of it and must be tested against the lives of many people because that's fundamentally what we're studying, our human experiences. What are they and what do they mean and so forth. I'd like to begin by talking for a short while about the difference between religious studies and theology. Religious studies is a relatively new phrase. And it's a new phrase because it's a new kind of study. First, it's new in the institution through which it's conducted. Theology has ordinarily been conceived as reflection on the experience, the teaching, the doctrines of a given church or a given people. And usually the institutional base for the study of theology has been the seminary or the divinity school. One is reflecting on the way of life of a particular people, a denomination, a church, or in the case of those groups that don't have churches, that are not properly spoken of as a church, of a people, a monastery, a divinity school, a seminary. 
Religious studies, by contrast, has its institutional base in the university. And often enough in a university that is quite secular, which has no direct and perhaps no indirect connections to religious bodies or religious groups or religious peoples. There, nevertheless, scholars are interested in the experience of human beings, both in their own culture and in other cultures. Actually, it often happens that they're more interested in the experience of others in other cultures than in the people in their own culture. It's easier in most American campuses, especially state university campuses, to study the religions of India or the religions of China or of Japan or of Africa or of the Near East than to study the religions of America because there might be some conflict of church and state, it's sometimes said, if you study things close to home. In any case, in the last 20 years, there has come to be a highly institutionalized movement numbering many thousands of scholars concerned about the study of religion in universities, not concerned about the preparation of ministers or priests or clergy, not concerned about the preparation of teachers even for the churches and the Sunday schools and so forth, Sabbath schools or what have you, not concerned about preparing monks or nuns, but concerned about the phenomena of religious aspiration, thinking, feeling, acting, creating of institutions. There may or may not be, in fact, a great difference between theology and religious studies. One can imagine doing theology with all the methods in a seminary that are used in a university. And one can imagine approaching religious studies with all the systematic care that used to go into theology. And so it's quite possible that people teaching in one kind of institution would do work very like that of people teaching in another kind of institutions. Yet there didn't used to exist these institutions called universities before. And there didn't used to be the number of people working in the field before. So we are faced with a relatively new phenomenon, a new kind of study. And that's the first simple point that I want to make. The second point. I'm sorry that this is going to take a, a bit of a, an academic form, and I am going to make a series of points. But I want to do it because it is a new field. And I know that here at the university, um, there is, have, have been some moves toward establishing, and I suppose there are to be yet further moves towards establishing, work in this field. And therefore, I'd like to be a little bit more careful and a little bit uh, more clear in marking out step by step um, my own approach to these matters. The second point then that I want to make is a, to give an initial definition of religious studies just to help us get started. Religious studies is a systematic and self-critical reflection on meanings of human experience. It's systematic in the sense that it aims at studying the whole human race. And it aims on doing it carefully and step by step um, with all the precision and all the theory building that are necessary to make sense to ourselves of the incredible religious experiences on this planet and in their incredible variety. It's difficult if you live and grow up in the United States to get out of your head the notion that religion means something like Christian churches, where there are buildings, where there are creeds, where there are denominations, theological traditions, and so forth. In most of the world, such things don't exist quite like that. You can't even speak of Judaism 
as a religion in quite the same sense. Being Jewish has much more the ring of belonging to a culture or belonging to a people than that of belonging to a church. Being Jewish doesn't have with it that severe, clear sense of creed that being a Christian has. Being Jewish is quite different from being Christian. And it's a different kind of religion. The categories of religion are quite different in both cases. In other words, this simple word religion has many different sorts of meanings. Shinto is religion in a different sense from Judaism. In many forms of Buddhism, there is no belief in God, a supreme being, or whatever. And yet one is talking about a religion. And in Islam, the boundary line between state and culture and religion is drawn very differently from the way those boundaries are drawn in the rest of the Western world. So one shouldn't assume that our experience of religion puts us in a good position to understand the rest of the phenomena of religion in the world. Quite the opposite. It sometimes blocks us. And that's what I mean by that second notion. It's a self-critical reflection. You have to come to see in this field how your own habits of life, the things you love most, the things you care about most, may prevent you from understanding others who are different. They may also help you. But you have to come to learn to see what it is that's within you so that you know what, as well as you can know, what you're filtering out when you encounter others or what you're systematically distorting when you encounter others. So it is a systematic reflection and it is a self-critical reflection. And it is reflection. Religious studies is not direct experience. It's quite conceivable that a person without any religious experience be involved in religious studies. John Cogley has a marvelous saying. He says that uh, religion, being religious is like having an ear for music. Either you have it or you don't. And most of those who don't join religious organizations. <laughs> Meaning that to be in the presence of an invisible and voiceless God is terrifying and too uncertain and not satisfying. And thus many people find it much easier to deal with putting up church buildings, teaching children, raising money, organizing activities, um, joining committees. That people can understand. Dealing with a God whose judgments are not ours and whom we cannot touch or taste or see or feel or have any clear concept of is much too dark and much too scary and gives much too little support. And so people commonly flee from it. Well, in any case, religious studies is an act of reflection or of theory building. It's an attempt to understand. And finally, it's reflection on an attempt to build a theory about human experience. As I said at the very beginning, what we're concerned with is what you think and feel, what you grope for, what meanings you see in your life of whatever sort. They may be meanings that are best described in agnostic or in atheistic terms. They may be meanings that are conceived in highly individualistic terms, or they may be in largely group terms. You may feel part of a movement. You may be interpreting most of the deeds of your life just now in terms of women's liberation or a political movement 
for some movement, for a certain kind of field, uh, direction in your scientific field. Or, but whatever gives, gives meaning to what you do from hour to hour, moment to moment, that is the proper focus of religious studies, the way in which human beings give meaning to their own experience. That's the focus of religious studies. Some of those meanings, as I say, are agnostic and atheistic. If you study Buddhist religion, if you study parts of Christianity, parts of Judaism, and so forth, you can only describe the phenomena there rather as atheistic than as theistic. Religious studies is just as interested in studying the kinds of meanings that people like Bertrand Russell or Jean-Paul Sartre or Albert Camus or any number of American scientists or philosophers or ordinary people, the meanings that they give to their lives. Because these are not the meanings that everybody in the world gives to their life. And it's fascinating to compare ways of life, ways of living, ways of giving meaning. Moreover, you can't understand any one of those ways adequately except by comparing it with all the others. It's a little easier for you, for example, if you're brought up in France. In the United States, should one even be able to discuss such matters, and it's not easy to discuss them in the United States in, in, many, in much company. You can say almost anything you want about your sexual life in most contexts in America, at a cocktail party or anyway, and you won't shock anybody. But you embarrass people tremendously if over your martini you begin to talk about your difficulties in mental prayer or a mystical experience that you had last week, or whatever. It's much too private to talk about in public. But should you be able to talk, and talk well, about religious experience? It is not a skill highly developed in the United States. In my very first class at Harvard, I'll never forget, a man most eminent in his field, a Kantian scholar, introducing us to the critique of pure reason came apart upon those passages in Kant's introduction in which he gives the religious reasons for writing this book and how it fits into his overall religious purpose. And he uses, in passing, the word grace. And the professor asks, without care, without concern, does anybody in the room have any idea what he means by grace? Meaning it wasn't important enough for the professor himself to have looked up or thought about. And that was the general attitude towards religious matters. They're not sufficiently serious for a professional person to get exactly. Grace, schmace, you know, uh, as if there weren't a hundred different views of grace, uh, even among Christian groups in Germany at that period. What does it matter what Kant thought about grace to the man who was teaching this course? Well, that carelessness about religious things is rather common in the United States. But should you get back past that point, it still happens that it's often, it's easy enough for many Americans, even in cultivated environments, to say of themselves that they're atheists, let us say. In France, that wouldn't be enough. Atheist, and more like whom? Like Camus? Like Merleau-Ponty? Like Sartre? Like Pancro? one would have to give a much more exact definition of one's inner life, publicly, because the public discussion of these matters is quite proper. It's the part of a civilized person to be able to express outwardly the inward form of life and to define it with some precision. It's not true in the United States. We're extraordinarily sloppy about things like that. Remember President Eisenhower said, after hearing the results of a Gallup poll, he said, uh, and I've just read in the papers that 98% of the American people believe in God, and I don't care which God it is, he said. Roughly like that. 
Well, religious studies, therefore, is systematic, it's self-critical, it's reflection, and its focus is on the meanings of human experience. Now, I want to rush on to make a few comments about what's different about religious studies. First, it's planetary in scope. We're talking about the whole planet. You remember that we often use the phrase humanities. And I gather here at the university, there is some increased emphasis on the humanities and the university as a whole. What does this mean, this humanities? Often under the rubric of humanities, we were taught something like this, at least when I was in school, see if it's true for you as well. We were given roughly this image of human history. The world began somewhere in the area of the Near East, perhaps, in the land of Ur. And out of that beginning, there arose almost like an arrowhead of evolution, progress. Dun, da, dun, dun, da, dun, and when, you know, time was always marching on, upwards. And the arrowhead of human progress moved from the Near East, from Jerusalem, thereabouts, to Alexandria and Antioch, to Constantinople, over to Rome, Paris, and London. And in the due passage of time, it skipped the ocean and jumped over this arrow tip of advance to Washington, New York, and Ames, you know, straight across, <laughs> and straight across the continent. And we thought, with all due humility, that we represented progress. We even spoke about underdeveloped countries. And what we meant by undeveloped countries became clear. It meant countries that weren't like us. And developed countries are countries that were like us. We were developed, more advanced. One day, in the, one night, I had a fright, and I began to contemplate that we were here at the very arrow tip of evolution in advance, and that we were to make Herculean struggles with our life to help to develop the rest of the world. And I suddenly had the vision that when we would reach down to our bootstraps and lift and try to press the whole world upwards, our tar target would be that we should try to make the, bring the whole world up to the level of New Jersey. Um, and this would be bring humanity to its highest fulfillment and its highest destiny. Um, that this would bring about a greater perfection in the human race than it had known any place else um, or at any other time. In short, what we were taught of as the humanities turns out on mature reflection not to have been humanity at all. It was much more ethnocentric than that. We were essentially talking about, when one examines it critically, the history of Northern and Western Europe, and of Southern and Eastern Europe if it was old enough. I mean, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, that was all right. Uh, not in the modern period, for sure. We were basically talking about the history of the white race, and in the Northern and Western part of the white race, and indeed of its upper classes, we were taught painfully little about the arts, the habits, the practices, the cultured, the culture of the poor through all those ages. We were taught, by and large, the history of the upper classes. Hence, under the rubric of the humanities, we were taught about only a little of humanity. Now, religious studies, to repeat my point, is by contrast planetary in its scope. We are engaged in the study of religious forms of life at whatever point they appeared on the planet, appear now or in the past, and in whatever social class or social stratum. All of these are fit subjects of study and necessary subjects of study. Secondly, I want to point out what is obvious, that religious studies is not, therefore, denominational any longer that increasingly religious studies, or I shouldn't even say increasingly, that religious studies has demanded that people learn what I have come to call 
a pluralistic habit of mind. They become as clear as possible about their own roots and their own definition. None of us is infinite. None of us represents the human race. No man, at least any longer, can speak for women. And no one woman speaks for all women. No one man for all men. We each come out of our own culture. We each come out of our own past. And coming to some terms with those limitations in ourselves is a very important step. And then secondly, we must deal with materials that take us far beyond ourselves. We must deal with cultures and with experiences of a sort we ourselves have never shared. And of course, it's in that step that comes a great deal of the excitement and a great deal of the interest. At one and the same time, aware of our own particularity and obliged to reach at least that partial kind of universality, which comes with dealings with others who are different and trying to understand them exactly. There are some Protestant theologians with whom I've worked who can give a clear interpretation and a more accurate interpretation of such things as Catholic notions of papal infallibility or whatever else than any Catholic scholar around, and vice versa. And there are Jewish scholars who have given a better interpretation of certain elements of the thought of Paul Tittich, let us say, than that of any Christian. And so there are Christians who have seen in Buddhism things that no Buddhist ever saw, and Buddhists in Christianity the reverse. And you can give an examination to a university class even on, let us say, the Christian creed, as I sometimes did at Stanford, where more than half of the student body, half of those taking the examination, would not be Christian, half thinking of themselves as atheist or ag agnostic. And it was marvelously ironic to see the atheist or agnostic score the highest marks simply in understanding what is meant, what is intended. Religious studies involve the identity of the inquirer. There is no way, in an important sense of the word, to be objective in religious studies. There is no way to stand outside the playing field. No way to pretend to be an umpire or a referee. We are each involved in the giving of meaning to our life. We are each involved in imagining our life one way or another way, and in living it one way or the other way. Even if we ourselves are not conscious of how we're doing it, even if we ourselves don't make an explicit decision about how we're doing it, a novelist or some other observer watching us could write with some accuracy an interpretation of what we were doing and could discern the very things in our own life that we ourselves didn't want to face. Every time we move a foot, every time we get through a day, we are creating a way of life whether we think about it or not. That is to say, we are committing ourselves. If not in thought, then by our actions, and by our actions is surely far more significant than by our thoughts. So we are giving a meaning to our life, each of us is. And in that respect, in interpreting meaning in human life, we're always doing it through the meaning we ourselves have given. We understand meanings around us only insofar as we are capable of understanding. Human life is deep enough, as, it is, as the proverb puts it, for an elephant to drown in 
or for a mouse to swim in. And there are many mice teaching, studying, writing, learning. In this field as in every field. There, there are pygmies in every field who, in order to understand anything, chop it down to their own size. I often thought that one of the great tragedies of great minds like a, that of Thomas Aquinas is that having to be taught to so many thousands of students all across the world, they are necessarily at the mercy of the limited understandings of those who teach them. People who couldn't come up to their knees in intellectual height interpret their works to others and give a sawed off version to those they teach. And it's inevitably uh, this way. If you don't understand very much about honesty in your own life, it's very difficult to discern its nuances in the life of others. There are many subtleties that one doesn't come to see. I once had a student who did a rather brilliant paper about honesty. I often ask students to do a paper on early in a course in a way that I define, and I won't take the time to define it all now because I have some specific meanings for it, but roughly of the scope, who am I? List the several experiences in your life which most tell you, I say, who you are. What experience, concentrate on the experiences, which five or six or two or three or ten, I don't care what the number is, but give me the experiences in your life which you think are most important in your life for giving you your sense of who you are, how you think, what you want to be, and so forth. Now, one thing I've learned is that everybody in the whole country is for honesty. Every student that I've ever encountered thinks that honesty is one of the highest values. There's a saying uh, about the French, uh, I think it's in My Fair Lady, the French don't care what you do so long as you pronounce it correctly. And I think uh, there's something equivalent about Americans. Uh, Americans don't care what you do so long as you're honest about it. Um, there's a cult of honesty. And everybody believes it's so simple to be honest. We want honest government, candor, openness, as though it's the easiest thing in the world. In any case, this student did a, f a paper talking about how when he was very young, he thought that honesty meant saying in words what you were thinking or feeling. That's what his parents disciplined him into doing. Not having done one thing and saying another, or thinking or feeling one thing and saying another, but getting them lined up. And then honesty came to mean also in school, not cheating, not copying, not putting down as his own work, work that belonged to others. And then honesty came to be as he was a teenager, um, being sincere, that other great American virtue, uh, which even our presidents love so deeply. Uh, it's a, the most necessary virtue of a politician. Um, sincerity, the very virtue that makes you trust politicians least when they are being most sincere, at least if you're wise. Wherever you see sincerity, to be skeptical, that's the new wisdom. But in any case, to be sincere. Hence, when he came to college, basing his life on sincerity, having seen the corruption of the adult world, he fell in love with a girl. It wasn't so clear that she was totally in love with him. But she was, and he persuaded them they should be sincere. Translated means live together, which they did. Um, with some trouble and some trepidation, because in another context, both of them had been taught that this was wrong. Well, it may be wrong, but they felt this way, and therefore they should be sincere to their feelings, which made it right. The only problem was that after a time, they began to fall out with one another, maybe. They were reluctant to talk about the falling out. Because if they brought up the subject, they would have to be sincere about it. And if they had to be sincere about it, they might break up a very comfortable relationship. 
which neither one of them at this point was quite ready to give up. And besides, he wasn't really sure whether he really had begun to dislike the girl or was just going through that normal up and down thing you go through when you love. Um, and therefore, maybe the sincere thing was to just keep quiet, or maybe it was to tell her everything. He wasn't quite sure what was sincere now. What should I be sincere to? My long range ambition, which is to keep this thing going till I graduate? <laughs> or, or the way I happen to feel moment by moment? I'm trying to point out sincerity became messier and messier. And it was hard to know which time he was being sincere. It's like when she told him that she loved him on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays and not on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays. She called it sincerity. He thought of it as fickleness. Um, Everything was getting confused. Well, in every decade of his life, this very simple notion of honesty or sincerity had begun to change and begun to be more and more difficult. And I assure you that had they married, had they had children, there would have been yet other changes in other decades. Until about the time he was 50 years old, Blaise Pascal commented, there are not three honest men in a century. And he didn't mean two. He meant that it is exceedingly difficult to be honest, even for a 24-hour period. The just man says to the Bible, sins seven times a day. And it doesn't mean seven. It means endlessly. There is nothing easier than to get human beings to fudge the truth. Even professors, even we who, are, who profess truth as our profession for the search for it, are so easily led into the belief that we're far more important in the intellectual history of our time than we ever shall be. You only have to give a professor a book in his field and count the number of seconds it takes him to come to the index to flip through to see if he's mentioned. You know, how do you like that for objectivity? or tell someone that he has beautiful ears or that she has a beautiful nose. And for the rest of their life, they'll believe it. They'll keep looking in the mirror, wondering what you saw in their nose or their ears, but thinking they must be attractive if somebody said so, or that you have a beautiful walk. The point I'm trying to make is that so as with the notion of honesty, so with every important religious notion, conscience, compassion, irony, endurance, um, virtually every notion. Depending on what you yourself have gone through, the depth you yourself have reached, so you understand what other people are saying. You think they're exaggerating when the saints or the holy ones of the different religions say something odd. You think it's odd because you aren't anywhere at their level of experience. And as you get there, you marvel at how much they learned in the intervening years. Well, religious studies deeply involves the person. And you can read any piece of writing in the field and spot soon enough how far the person is along how much they understand the authors they are dealing with. You spot very quickly in religious studies the relationship between the writer or the investigator and the material being investigated. It shows up in other fields as well, but for several reasons in no field more sharply than here. Religious studies are highly personal and there's no way to get around it. You can't fudge it, you can't hide it in this field as well as in others. It's something we have to cope with and therefore we have a different way of approaching the question of objectivity. As I say, there's no way to be objective in the sense of being outside. There's no way of pretending to be a scientific instrument. What you can be is self-critical and submitted to the intersubjective criticism of others. That is, taking into account the way others in the field have examined the same phenomena and measure yourself against the battery of others looking at the same material from different points of view. 
You're not lost in your own subjectivity. In other words, there are ways of getting outside your own subjectivity, but there's no way of being objective. There are ways of getting criticisms and taking readings from different points of view, but there's no way of getting off the playing field. But secondly, I want to stress religious studies are, person, are, are social. They're not only personal, they're social. We're not only talking as individual persons in religious studies. We, we always find ourselves in the position of being part of a people, part of a we. We carry with us a group far more than we recognize, especially in this country and in this culture where there's such a cult of the individual. A friend of mine, actually who's now at the consulate in Moscow, but when he was in this country as a young officer in the State Department, was assigned to escort a Russian visitor around the United States. And after six weeks of touring, my friend asked the Russian, what were your observations? And the man said, well, the most impressive thing to me was how much the same you are everywhere you go. And he meant, like, look at the chairs here in this room. These chairs could be in Atlanta, Georgia, or Portland, Oregon, or New York City. The, floor, the clothes we wear came out of the same factories the people there are wearing. The cars we drive, somewhere underneath Nebraska, there's a central kitchen that feeds all the cafeterias in the country. <laughs> uh, it's so much the same. But anyway, the Russian said, how do you do it, he said. For 50 years, we have been trying to do this in the Soviet Union. I said, how did you bring it about? By contrast, there's an ad, I think it's for a shampoo, which shows a woman out on top of a, um, I don't know what you even call it, a little standing little mountain out in the desert, just in the middle of a canyon. Uh, it must have been put there by helicopter. There's no way she could have climbed the walls. But anyway, it says something about if you use this shampoo, I think it's a shampoo, um, you will release the true woman within you. But what if there isn't any, you know? I mean, what if you look for a true you and there just isn't one? The, the idea that we are all individual, that we are all different, that we're all unique, that we're all special, flies in the face of the fact that, look, here we are all dressed the same, not only that. Here we are all using the same kind of vocabulary, the same kind of words, and here we all, if the truth were known and we were tested on it, having very much the same ideas. Little nuances of difference. But were we to go anywhere in the world, it would take people approximately three minutes to figure out that we were Americans. Disguise ourselves as we will. And probably three minutes to figure out which part of the country we're from. And which social class we're from. And which religious denomination we belong to, and so forth. People with astute eyes do that very quickly. Surely an anthropologist could. That is to say, we are much more social creatures than our own ideology allows us to notice. And therefore, it becomes increasingly important in religious studies to fight against some of the tendencies of American individualism so as to bring forward to consciousness those ways in which we participate, each one of us, in several different groups, in several different social groups, and bring to whatever we study a consciousness that did not begin with us, before we even became aware of it, we had already been thrown. We already had certain ideas. I mean very simple things. I noticed about 10 years ago at the very first ecumenical meetings when Protestants and Catholics were sitting down to talk seriously together for the first time in a long time and to be friendly together, still it always happened that at 3 o'clock in the morning, sitting over the remains of the scotch, there were only Roman Catholics present. And early the next morning, at the next day's meeting, only the Protestants were clear-eyed and ready to go to work. And if we had the meeting under Protestant auspices, we always started an hour earlier than if we had it under Catholic auspices. They're just two very great social differences. And if you talk about notions of God, even though you use the same words, even though it seems as though you're talking the same theology, often the whole sense of images and the whole sense of symbols by which you come at these words is very different depending on the tradition you're brought up in. Example, I have to exaggerate a bit, but, but I'm trying to draw in broad strokes and, and, and not be precise at the moment. But in general, in Northern and Western Europe, in the countries that are by and large, and interestingly enough, isn't it, by and large the Protestant countries, in countries in Northern and Western Europe, ordinarily the word God 
functions in psychological context, in, in images, in metaphors, that link the language of religion to the language of morality. The general feeling seems to be, I won't say that theology is, but the general feeling seems to be, if you really believe in God, then you will be moral. If you really believe in God, then you must act out the brotherhood of man, and so forth. And the notion seems to be, if you don't, if you're not moral, then you're not really religious. You're just mouthing empty words. Now, in Southern and Eastern Europe, again, I'm going to state it a little bit too starkly, but by contrast, God is not a sky god of that sort the eye of conscience, watching our behavior and our moral practice. In Southern and Eastern Europe, the language of religion functions much more in the context not of morality, but of nature, of earth. And being religious is much more linked to a sense of oneness with the earth, a sense of awe, even a sense of evil and a sense of gratitude and tears, as when um, Alyosha, in the Brothers Karamazov, falls on the earth and tries to embrace the earth, and his fingers claw the black dirt. And he tries to press himself into the earth, and his tears are falling on the earth. That's more the religious image of Southern and Eastern Europe, and in which there's a sharp distinction between religion and morality. It's quite acceptable that one could be immoral and still very religious. Morality, immorality, that doesn't have a direct tie with being religious. Most very moral people are not religious. So this notion goes. When you find somebody that's very moral, you know something's wrong with them. They don't have a really religious feeling. They don't, they're not really in tune with religion. And by contrast, there are some people who are just awful, whose moral lives are a mess, who can be very religious. And it's quite proper to have that judgment. Of course, in both traditions, you should be religious and moral. And a few people manage to be both. But there's such a different feeling. It is an earth god, if you wish, and a sky god. So even when you're using the language of God, as long as you're talking about it abstractly, you seem to be on the same wavelength. And the minute you start, start to turn, turn towards the metaphors and the, the kind of language that surrounds the use of God and the kind of experiences out of which the language grows, you find you're in a different world altogether. Now, for many of us, we've not made conscious to ourselves our own inheritance. We don't realize that we're doing one thing rather than the other. And there are many variations on these two gross things that I've drawn. The Scotch-Irish and the English are very different and the Celts different yet again, and so on in, in Eastern Europe. Many differences and many shades of difference. And all those things are operating in America today. If we did a study of the group in this room, we would find them operating among us today, but without our being aware of it. We attribute, I believe, many more things to our own individuality and our own caprice than is accurate. Many of those things which we just happen to do just because we feel like doing them, we're actually doing out of strong emotional and even unconscious currents that are social. I ask young men particularly who are wearing beards or mustaches of various sorts to look if they can find them to pictures of their grandparents, their grandfathers. Because more often than not, it's true that even though the young man never thought of this, never thought of it, his grandfather cut his beard or his mustache in exactly the same way he has his. There are many different shapes and styles, obviously. It's astonishing how often in the third generation the pattern repeats unconsciously what went before. It's not always true. But in a, I use that as an instance only of the way in which often we do things which we think we thought up all by ourselves, where, when we are, in fact, carrying with us social currents which we don't terribly well understand, but which deeply affect all of us. Religious studies, in any case, are always social. 
then coming to some terms with our own social identity is exceedingly important. It is a we, not only an I. Thirdly, there is an institutional development in religious studies. One must study institutions. It's not only true that one, has a, that one studies personal feelings, personal ideas, personal striving. It's not only true that one studies social groups. You also have to study the different form of institutions, because these are significant. In Vietnam, how could it be that Catholics in South Vietnam, who were about a tenth of the population, could run so many of the offices of the country? Especially since many of them came from North Vietnam to begin with. How could they do it? That's the question the Buddhists kept asking themselves. How do they do it? And they came up, for, I'm speaking roughly again, but, but, but actually explicitly, that is, I heard a Buddhist monk make this point. They do it because the Catholic Church, having experience with a variety of political systems, and especially in urban environments, and this is long before Mayor Daley in Chicago, this is a little way, way back centuries ago, had to learn how to adjust itself to a spiritual organization to political forms of life, and it organized itself along political lines. That is, it built up a set of institutions which are as political as any ward, uh, precinct, district organization. It organized itself. The Buddhists do not do that, not in Vietnam at any rate. The Buddhists have a very modest and low form of organization. And mainly they have a pattern of almost local monasteries who deal almost entirely with the people of that particular region, and only by word of mouth do they hear from others. There's no hierarchy. There are no bishops. There are no monks who really have authority over a whole district, or over a whole part of the country. And so the Buddhists began just about the time that Catholics around the world were struggling to deorganize themselves and learn more about decentralization and contemplation and so forth. The Buddhists, at least in Vietnam, were beginning to form a national organization and to divide themselves by districts and to portion out political authority. Because they said, if we don't, we're not going to be able to survive. Well, you have to understand these different political groups among people, these different institutionalizations of religion. Because most of the individuals who have religious experiences have them by contrast or comparison with the institutions that they meet up with. And sometimes they're affected well by those institutions and sometimes badly. There are many people who reject Roman Catholicism, for example, who outgrow it or who even reject it in open rebellion, who go on in their later lives to exemplify the fact they learned all the important and essential lessons from it. I remember walking with Robert McAfee Brown one day in a, in a peace march in San Francisco. This was in the very early days of the protests, and everybody in the street, all around us, were carrying signs saying, peace, love, justice, and so forth. And Bob Brown turned to me and he said, uh, you know, I used to get so discouraged teaching Sunday school, I thought nobody was listening. <laughs> <laughs> and all the people who rejected Sunday school were here back with the Sunday school slogans uh, on their little signs. Well, the point I'm trying to make is that there's, there's an, a, a fascinating dialectic between the kind of...